So uh, what do you want to talk about first? Uh, so I was working on a feature of an Ember app last week, and uh, I needed to um, hide and show a menu. And this, I had a variable called is showing, and it was a Boolean. Um, and there were different parts of the page that could open the menu, and there were other parts of the page that could close the menu. Um, and so I was thinking about like how to do this and how to use like data down actions up to pass around like this is showing Boolean and then have an action to, to set it to false and then an action to set it to true or even just an action to toggle it, right? Uh, I did this and then I was kind of looking at my code. I was like, man, there's a lot of configuration. Every time I want something to be able to close a menu, I end up passing a toggle function as well as a Boolean to it. Everything I want, you know, every time I want something open in the menu, same thing. Um, so I, I took all that out and I just started passing around uh, is showing property to all my components. And the components that could uh, close the menu would do this dot set is showing false. And the components that could open the menu, they do this dot set is showing true. And they were all just kind of sitting there overwriting each other. And I felt kind of like guilty you because it dirty yeah but it worked great it worked great it was so much simpler than yeah. passing around all of these actions well i thought you were going to say you start passing like a service around to them or or they all had access to a service because this boolean property is kind of like a singleton in a sense sure right because yeah. it's like a single menu it's not like a reusable thing sure I, actually i think that's a great point i think that i could have um injected a service into every component mm -hmm. and had an alias to is showing. And I think that would have had the same effect that I'm right. talking about here. Is avoiding the wiring. Right. And then I was thinking like, um, so like, this is so interesting because like, where do we get into trouble when doing this kind of thing? And you can imagine like if this was reusable or let's say uh, if it was more than just two states, like if it was more than just true or false, and now you have like three children that have this thing and like one tries to override it and the other didn't expect it or something like that. I, you know, I was thinking about this. I think the, the place where you get into trouble here is there's some component deep down in the tree that wants to close the menu, mm -hmm. but it's not sure if it can. So right. it basically says, I want to close the menu, but someone else could stop me. And wiring that up is really, really complicated. Right. That's where you want to use you know, actions up. Right. Or where you... Well, I was even thinking, but if you had a service in that case, you could give an API, put an API on the service, and then your service becomes like a mini state machine, let's say. Yep. But like, it feels like these are solving two different problems, right? Like, it feels like, on the one hand, we're talking about, should children be able to mutate this thing? That's like a free-floating variable. Mm -hmm. And um, how implicit or explicit should the relationship be between the state of this thing and these children components, like this component tree, right? And then on the other hand, it's like, okay, that happened to work out well with just a Boolean property, but then if it became complicated, like you could imagine writing a service with like a more constrained API than just setters. But like you could see someone getting into, a pro into trouble where they're using data down actions up and it starts getting crazy. But the reason it's getting crazy is not because, uh, sorry, you could imagine someone doing what you're doing, which is doing two-way bindings everywhere and it getting crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And then them saying like, two-way bindings is crazy, data on actions up is a way to solve this. But the real problem was that they needed something like a service with a more constrained API. So does that make sense? They're like two yes. different things. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. One is like, controlling uh, what state this modal or like this wizard could be in. And another is like, another aspect is like how implicit or explicit should the relationship between these components be? And like, if you're making like, remember in Ted when we had like a wizard thing where you're like uploading talk and there's like five different things, mm -hmm. but that's part, every component is like part of this talk upload form and it's only ever going to be used in a talk upload form and like a talk upload form can only be showing step one or step two or step three. Mm -hmm. So like it's, those are domain components with regards to that wizard and it's okay for them to know that. And it actually makes it much easier. Like using data down actions up in this situation could actually make it. Ah, ah cause you're saying this isn't something that's reusable. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. need the configuration. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. It's, I think it's interesting that 
I think most Ember developers today, if you told them to have a menu that appeared in five different parts of the website, sometimes really deep down in the, the HTML tree, I think most people would use data down actions yeah. or service. And, in you know, I case. think this kind of taught me that like, yeah, you don't need to reach for those things. There will be a time, there will absolutely be a time in this app, maybe in six months from now, where I need some some configuration or some like really fine grained control. And at that point, I'll make the decision to use a service or to to write actions that, hey, if you want to close, hey, component, if you want to close the menu, call this action rather than, hey, mutate this binding, mutate this variable. Right. So I was going to say, I wonder if we could find like an old episode of the podcast where we were like, I started using data actions up and it made it so much easier. <laughs> like I was passing around this binding and. Well, that's the thing. There will be a point where that happens. Um, but yeah, to pass in, you know, one action and one variable or, or even two actions, one action for open, one action for close, and then the variable, that's like, that's three things. That's, right. That's reaching for that out of the gate is, is too much. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, it just made me think, yeah, binding is, uh, binding is fine here. There's this, it's, it's a continuum. Yes. And yeah. and I think, yeah, if you're not experienced with Ember and you start relying on bindings and then you start wiring up things like observers, uh, that's where you get in trouble. And um, maybe limiting someone, you know, if I was going to give this component to a team, maybe I would take a different approach and I would say, hey, you know, it's it uses data down actions up or service, something that has a more constrained API. Right. So someone can't add an observer that says, you know, ember.observe is showing. Right. Because that, that, they would be able to do that. Right. And that would get them, them and me into trouble. Right. So. Right. <laughs> um, I was just thinking also on Ember Map, our video player has some shared state with like this play controls, like the speed controls. And like that's just, I think that's actually a service that they all inject, I think. Um, or it's just like um, an object or something that the video player shares with like the hero and the controls and like all that stuff. And you allow anyone to mutate it. Exactly, because, yeah. or there might even be an API, but it's probably just mutation. But the idea is like the video hero is a singleton. And like the reason I'm making these player controls is to control the one video player on the screen. So I'm not going to use it on actions up there. Like I don't need to configure what happened. Like I want to. This is also going to be used in an audio player. Yeah, exactly. Player. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. So, cool. yeah, it's interesting. I mean, this stuff comes comes up time and time again, but it's a constant. It reminds me of like, yeah, OOP um, design, like when we're doing like full Rails apps and you're talking about like which model is responsible for this functionality. Like these kinds of questions are, they're not black or white and it's, it's a constant ongoing thing to know, you know, where, where the optimal place falls. Yep. So... <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not one of those things that's just an easy yes or no. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we were uh, traveling, uh, what was that, like two weeks ago? Yep. Um, we were in Las Vegas for MicroConf. Las Vegas. It was your first time in Vegas. It was my first time. It was not your first time in Vegas. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but we did get to play some poker, which was fun. Did pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we both stood up while we were still up. So that was good. I think at one point I was like, yeah, I have like $200 here. And you're like, you don't have $200 until you stand up from the table. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I feel like that's, that's like a seasoned piece of advice from like a, you know, wisdom from a seasoned yeah. veteran right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I did manage to stand up and come out ahead. So that was fun. Nice. Um, yeah, we were there for microconf. So we were there kind of meeting other like business owners, you know. And um, yeah, it was like uh, folks like us, like small, you know, small two, two, one to two person businesses. And, and I would say like 70 percent of the people were like tech there. Yeah. Like yeah. programmers that were familiar with React and, and uh, uh, Vue and, and many folks heard of Ember, too. Yep, definitely. Um, yeah, we got to we got to meet Adam Wadden and we got to interview him for the podcast last week. We posted that. And that was cool. We caught him in his uh, his um, hotel room after he had given a talk and been up and traveled and stuff. So he was pretty tired, but that was fun that we got we got to interview him there. It was great. Yeah, it was a great episode. Yeah, he's he's really um, he thinks pretty deeply about this stuff. So I felt like it's always fun when you talk to someone like that, and it's just you know he's been thinking about this for years, 
so the the steps in his arguments that come out are just like airtight yeah it feels like you know yeah. so that was really fun and um yeah so i got to meet adam and then also derek reimer who i had kind of interacted with online before um just through like a giant robots podcast from thoughtbot because he started that with uh he came on there with ben ornstein and then they have their own podcast our product now listen to that and so that was fun got to meet both of them and um, yeah it was just fun like talking to people and seeing you know a lot of javascript developers there i mean these days there's a lot of javascript developers everywhere <laughs> yeah you go to starbucks yeah, so it's, it's, guy, it's, it's true they're like oh i'm learning javascript at night <laughs> um and uh so it was kind of fun like it wasn't the ember bubble like it wasn't ember conference and actually like when i told people you know people asked us like uh, what do you do? Make Ember videos, and they're like, "Huh? <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, but why?" Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, it was really interesting. Like, once I talked to folks, like actually, time and time again, like it was. It's a really good congenial group of people, and they're all trying to learn from each other. And there's, it's not like you're fighting about anything when it comes to Ember and React and Vue. No. They were and, genuinely interested. And in, all, fact, in fact, this is like a, a, it's a small business conference. Yeah. So you're usually talking at that level. Yes. But the tech stuff comes up. Yes. So it's not, it's not, no one feels like they have to defend the technology there. Right. Which is awesome. Right. So people were like genuinely interested. Like, why do you use Ember for this? Like, um, I mean, there's probably some people there who had just learned in front of development in the last few years and maybe not even heard of Ember or just not really know about it. And um, so it was just fun talking about that and um, learning about the differences. Like, you know, one thing surprised me, like, um, of course, there's all sorts of cool stuff coming out in React and Vue. And then I was having this conversation and um, someone was talking about like, yeah, if I was, they were primarily React people when they did front end stuff, but they didn't just do front end stuff. And they would say things like, uh, they said something like, you know, if I was just gonna do my own thing, I would just like do a, was it a Rails app or like a, a, a Django app or something like that. Cause like adding React and getting all that working is like kind of just too hard, which kind of struck me because I think, I feel like for Ember developers, we invest so much in like building Ember apps and just thinking like, we like to think about like the right ways to do things from end to end. And if we were going to start a new app, like we would make it Ember just because. Yeah. I mean, we, we also like to think about all the things that are common across all, all of our apps. Yes. So I think there's less, there's less of the hardness. Yes. I mean, it, it is still hard. Of course it is. An Ember app or, or any JavaScript app is harder than, than a server rendered app. But I think with Ember, we spend so much time. Like you said, we spend a lot of time and we invest in the things that we can use across yes. over and over and over again. Ember CLI deploy is a fantastic example of this. Yeah. There's yes. one way to deploy an Ember app. Yes. So I think that was, a, that was a difference because I think, you know, the benefits of ecosystems that are kind of more fast moving maybe than Ember, like React, is that you get to try new things, but also you don't necessarily carry those same, you aren't doing the same thing you were a year or two or three ago. And so I, th I thought it was an interesting observation because I think, again, you and I would just make a new Ember app for whatever our next project is. Yep. And they were, they even said something like, yeah, it's just, you kind of, you get it going, obviously React is super easy and fast, but then it's like, you gotta make sure it works and like the, it's so easy to break it, like the routes, people mess up the routes a lot. And I was like, that's interesting because I know that was like Ember's big thing back in the day. And so it was kind of interesting just hearing again, you're not in like an Ember bubble and you're not in like a React bubble. You're just in a general area with like developers just talking for real about what their issues are. And like we talked about like what was hard with Ember too, which there's plenty of things that are hard with Ember. But um, yeah, it, like after talking about what we love about Ember and like what we're teaching people, it's like Ember still has a lot of strengths that I think the other frameworks don't have. Oh, absolutely. I mean, of course I believe that, but like it was nice to have that kind of validated by talking to like an actual Vue developer about what is hard for them and what's not. Right, it's not just you and I talking and, yeah. and nodding our heads. Yeah, exactly. Going, oh yeah, of course, Ember's great. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think after that, like talking with those people, <clears throat> some Ember's strengths are like Ember data, like as much as we ha love to complain about Ember data, as love people, you know, 
And maybe again, this is like everyone has their bias and their experience. We usually have control over our back ends. We usually get to um, make the back end suitable for the front end, and that makes our life with Ember Data a lot easier, right? Yes. Um, and so uh, that gives us a lot of the benefits of Ember Data's conventions, and we don't have to fight those a lot. But like the idea of having an identity map, because we were talking about GraphQL a lot. And this came up because I was talking with also with Derek about a new project he was working on that he was building with Elm. And um, he was building a GraphQL backend. And so he was talking about querying that and he's building like something that's like Slack. So it has like messages and you have like, let's say you get the first page of messages and each one of those messages has an author. So you might get like four messages that have the same author, right? So how do you deduplicate those things? And so I was talking about how Ember Data approaches this problem, right? With JSON API, you automatically have a format that's normalized, and then you have Ember Data's identity map. So like if the time of something changed, um, it would just show up. Ember Data would get updated, the interface would re-render, and you'd be good to go. And I was explaining all this, and like this is not how other communities do things. Like this is not a lot a lot of the ways how they do it. So I, I think Apollo is ha, has this model mm -hmm. that's a newer state management library in React. But like I think there's a lot of people who would just if they were making a new app, like in the same way that you and I would for some project, they would just spin up like a GraphQL server, just query the data they need and display it. But like it's okay to like deduplicate to to duplicate and render. So what is that? What does that look like? There is it just like it's a graph, and if the author is used four times, you get for JavaScript objects with the author? I think it's not GraphQL's job to deduplicate that payload. I see. And so you're also making a lot of decisions about the shape of your data. So like, you know, even Adam was talking about like, I query this thing and it's like, okay, how am I gonna represent this on the front end? And the answer is kind of like, well, you can represent it however you want to. Like if you were gonna, or, or even in Elm, Derek was saying as well, because you know, in Elm, it's more about like writing types uh, that constrain your data. So sometimes there's actually some, you know, when thinking about, uh, this was a deeper conversation, maybe we can get into it later, but like you're rendering like an author and it might have a comment, it might not, like you need to build that into the type, into your types. But anyways, at a high level, I think all the other communities, of course, there are some folks who kind of come from like the standard relational background and are used to just modeling things like we do. Um, they don't do that. And so part of their decision making process is like, okay, I want to fetch this data. How am I going to model and store it? Mm. Arrays of objects, objects with nested objects, like what kind of types or annotate, like all of these things are just things that as an Ember developer, we wouldn't really think about. You mentioned, you mentioned uh, Rails and Django before. You don't really think about these things in those technologies. Correct. So did you... I don't. I'm not sure what I'm trying to ask. Were you able to bring up like the, the back, em, the Ember, like these things are conventional on the back end, and right? They, they have these abstractions for you, and Ember is similar in this way that has these abstractions for you on, on the front end, right? Um, was that like relatable to them? Were they like, oh, cool, like there is JavaScript that I can write JavaScript how I write my my Rails app, right? You know what? As you're talking, like it makes me realize like the reason the stuff is basically non-issue for us is because we have the experience and spend so much time thinking about domain modeling on the server side that when we're thinking about it on the client, that is influencing us. We know a user and comments are going to be in separate tables. We know a foreign key is going to relate them. We know what they're going to be called. And it's all basically made up for us. That got me thinking. So I didn't really have that conversation, which I think would be an interesting one because obviously okay, the front end drives your server needs these days, that's good, but like the reality is also there's constraints in the back end that are gonna influence your front end. Like, you know foreign keys are the way relational data is work, so that's how you're gonna model your... I mean, there, there's implementation details yeah. in database systems that will leak yeah. all the way out to the front end. And that's fine, like those decisions were made for good reasons, and so like foreign keys are a great idea, so we should use those on the front end. So um, the only thing, to answer your question, like the only thing I remember on that line was just, you know, some folks were, ha, did have the more traditional relational background like we do. And they were like, I, 
they were basically saying like, yeah, I do have to kind of redo this on the front end or I do it in a separate way. It's not just like, here are my Rails models, so here are my Ember data models. You know what I mean? Um, but that got me thinking like, what about folks who are using like MongoDB or schema lists? Because I don't have as much experience with that. I mean, I've installed it and tried it out. But I wonder, I wonder how those data models look. Like if we were going to just move Ember Map backend over to a schema list database, would it completely change everything? Like, do you know? I don't know. I'm biting my tongue <laughs> so hard right now to not make a MongoDB joke. Right, but this is like the thing, right? Because right. we're in like the Rails and Ember and the, the relational. But like, what is it like to be, if you just got into the JavaScript ecosystem today, chances are you would be writing node servers with like MongoDB database and using React on the front end. And like, there, there, there are, there are guarantees that a relational database system makes that I think most traditional web applications want. Right. So I think you would be pushed to, to a relational database. Those are the right, but those are the drawbacks of non-relational databases. But what are the benefits, and why do so many people use them? Because I think a lot of people do. And the, so the, the non-relational yes, database, like, like MongoDB. Why, yeah. So like the one you always hear is I don't have to spend time defining a schema. Uh, the other one is I can change my schema over time. So I, I've, I see an argument that comes up a lot that uh, non-relational databases are great for like user game data because as you start to add new rules to the game or migrate the game, um, you can just take like snapshots of like the user data over time. Uh, and you don't have to worry about maintaining a schema. Oh, interesting. So that's that's one that I've heard like MongoDB works out really well there. And of course, of course, you can model this yeah. in, in, in MySQL or Postgres, yeah, any yeah, relational yeah. system. But uh, that's, yeah. I think we would have like one thing that I never think about is I don't think about like array types when right. I think about data. Right. So it's always the foreign key and the has many belongs right. to. Um, so I think our thinking might change there. That's right. like something we're never thinking about, even though we're always, we are thinking about things as lists. Um, yeah, to answer that question. Yeah, I don't know. So yeah, that was interesting. So that I think that was like a big piece of it where um, folks were pretty interested in how data state man, basically it's like the way to say it in 2018 is like, how are you doing state management in your app? It's just that we've had Ember data since the beginning and that's how we do state management. Yeah. Like, you know, and we differentiate between like state that's persistent and, you know, transient state in the application runtime state that's like tied to components and stuff. Um, and so, I, yeah, just it was a lot of fun to being able to talk about that. And they were like genuinely intrigued about identity maps and relations and stuff like that. And how like in a template, yeah, you can just fetch a graph and then like each author dot comments as comment, comment dot text. It's like, it's pretty awesome. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I like it, but it's also cool to see other people like it, even if, you know, they are saying things like, why do you use Ember? Isn't that like five years old or whatever? So it's kind of interesting. So I feel like, you know, we've, we've been talking a little bit about like kind of upping Ember's marketing materials and getting them in line with the reality of Ember development from a day-to-day -day developer's perspective. And I feel like, yeah, that's a selling point. Like that is a selling point. You feel like there's enough of like low hanging fruit with these folks where you could, you could present this stuff and they'd be like nodding along. I think if you were going to make a video and um, <clears throat> if you were going to make a video and you were going to say like, here's what it's like to work on a new Ember app in 2018, like Ember data would definitely be a part of it. And like querying data and like showing, changing data and having it re-render everywhere. And um, yeah, like you already have the identity map, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think if you're just fetching, I think the common case, like fetching data and just displaying it, that's really easy to do with something that supports that, like a GraphQL backend. Um, the complex parts that need the identity map are where you're like doing draft work on the client. Maybe you like, if you were to go offline and then change something, like Ember data gets you some part of the way there because you have that data in memory in like a rich, in a mapped place. Um, some other things, I'm trying to think of some of the other things we talked about. Um, just the conventions, like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of folks there who do come from the Rails background and appreciate the conventions. And yeah, just talking about those and talking about like the kinds of things that we don't worry about. And um, 
you know, how every app, Ember app looks the same and teams can rotate developers on to new Ember apps and get them deploying from day one. Like, yeah, people were pretty, you know, excited about hearing that. And then the testing stuff as well, like um, talking about how you have the test runner there out of the box, you know, again, zero config. It's like configure it, con convention without configuration, convention over configuration, but these days zero config. But the idea being like, yeah, you start a new Ember app and every Ember app has acceptance testing wired up, ready to go. So I think that, I think there was some really cool stuff just kind of, again, being out of the bubble and talking about it with folks. And then of course there's awesome stuff coming in React too. This guy was talking about the async rendering stuff. It sounded really cool. But um, yeah, it was, and, and also like talking to some people who don't do JavaScript every single day and they have to kind of decide what to use and they're like thinking about different things. You know, what I kept coming back to is, is that like not every single person, if you just force them to use Ember, would have a good time and would be successful with it. Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, imagine only 10% of your job is, is front end. Right. You would hate Ember. Right. It's, there's a ton. Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of, you know, what we were talking about was like, what is it good for? Who's going to have the most successful success with it? Yeah. People who are going to learn the architecture, willing to buy into the conventions, willing to go along with the community, um, people who value things like community decision making and, um, you know, uh, conventions and yeah, just value the things that Ember values. So yeah, it was, it was a cool, it was a cool conversation. Nice. Um, it was fun talking about Elm too. Like I would love to check out Elm a little bit. It seems pretty crazy, <laughs> but it seems pretty fun. Nice. Um, have you done any Elm? I did the, um, there's like an Elm starter project where you make a counter and then like you make another counter and then you just like keep making counters of counters. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Um, that's as much, that's as much as I've done. Yeah. Nice. So it sounds like we need to send you, send you around all around the world to other conferences and you can be like the Ember uh, missionary. <laughs> hey, I'm up for it. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Some people legit jealous of the, you know, the things that we're talking about that we have in our normal Ember development. Like, it's just nice to have a conversation with someone, appreciate what they have, but then see that they appreciate what we have too. Is there a better way to like get someone excited about Ember than to sh like talk about something, show them something and make them jealous? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I again, I was there for a week I talked to like a dozen people. I met Corlin Allen, who is an Ember developer who runs Indie Hackers. That was super cool. Um, there was another guy there who runs, um, what was the name of the website? It was the coaching one. Oh, I don't know. It was like, it was like three letter, like a short word. It was like Dick Duck or something like that. You know what I'm saying? It was like coaching. Isn't that the uh, video game? Duck Hunt? No. <laughs> no. It was like Dig Dig or something like that. Okay. It was... Um, it was an Ember app though. Yeah. And it was the, you know, you had her session. It was her company. I don't remember the name of the company. Yeah. And so he was an Ember developer and he had, and so he, and he recognized me and, and, I, and, um, and Corlin recognized me too. So that was fun talking That's to him. That's super cool. Yeah. He's a super <laughs> cool guy. And Indie Hackers is like beautiful sites, all Ember. It works great. Yes. It's really cool. Um, yeah, I've never seen it like really talked about that much, but it's it's a great Ember app. It's a great Ember site. It's big too, um, owned by Stripe now. You know, Stripe does great work on design, so that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, over the course of the week, just talking to like, you know, 10, 12 people. And um, yeah, people like genuinely interested in Ember architecture, what the architecture of an Ember app is like and how does it compare to other apps that they've worked on. So yeah. Um, yeah, I do think it would be fun to, to talk about it at other places and just with other people because I think I think Ember has a lot to offer in, 20, in 2018 for sure. Absolutely. I mean, we obviously believe that. We wouldn't have a <laughs> but company called Ember Like Mouth. you said earlier, this validated it. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And like, and there's just a way to present the messages and the, the nuggets of, uh, of, of the architecture that we kind of take for granted, make them more palpable to people who aren't, you know... Um, living and breathing this every day like we are. Yep. So that's kind of what I took away from that. Cool. Yeah, it was fun. Very cool. So uh, yeah, what, what do you want to talk about next? Uh, so I've been doing 
just like some some testing TDD stuff. I'm, I'm finding it more in my workflow. Um, so TDD is this idea that you basically write a bunch of failing tests, then go off and write your code, and then you know your tests go from failing to passing as you write your code, and then when all your tests are passing, you're done, and and you know you've 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 built what you need to build. Right. I don't really like subscribe to this because oftentimes I don't really know what my API is when I'm starting to write code. So this idea of writing a bunch of failing tests kind of uh, assumes that you know your exact API. And there's usually some like more discovery as I'm writing code, I'll, I'll tweak stuff around. And the last thing I want to do is write a bunch of tests, go off and write code, realize the API code, was wrong, and then go back and write the test. It's like twice as much stuff to change. Um, so I've, I've found a more like of a, what I, what I've heard others call test before commit. So it's basically like write code, write tests, but before you, you commit your code, it's fully tested or, or it has good, not fully, but has good, it has a level of tests that, that you want. Um, and sort of what this means for like my Ember workflow, uh, I'm using pause test a lot more, like a lot, a lot, a lot more, um, I'll start off with like, I'll write the code. Once I start having um, to like fill something in, like like fill in a text box or like uh, do some transient state that's gonna be lost on page reload. That's when I usually like go over, I start writing a test, start using pause test. We have a helper called full screen. Um, you run the full screen helper in your test suite and it, it takes that little box that the test runner uses and, and full screens it. Um, so you have like a high fidelity development uh, if, environment. If I showed you this, you'd have no idea that I was uh, in the middle of a test. In the middle of test. I mean, you could look at the URL and see the testum URL and, and know from there. But right. um, yeah, I found this this workflow is awesome. That's great. So so just as soon as I hit transient state, start writing a test. Use pause test and full screen, and just like keep moving those around. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm like super happy with this. I've, I've noticed my coding is. I get features done a lot faster. That's great. So, so at the beginning, you were kind of saying like, um, you were talking about TDD, and so, but this is where you ended up: test before commit. Yeah, test before commit. And I think it, I think using pause test in Ember, it, it ends up working out really well. Right. Um, and then the new 3.0 rendering tests, they make it easier to they make it easier to write tests against components with kind of the whole world available to you. So you can have Mirage and you can have uh, services. Fill in, yeah, services. Well, you could you could have services before, but you can have like fill in and click. Uh, um, and you don't, there's not like some, you know, additional add-ons that are needed to get these things. They're right. just, it's built into the framework. Uh, so writing, um, I do this with components as well as with, uh, with kind of the acceptance tests, the full user experience. Um, and this is what you're you're teaching this on Ember Map right yeah. now, or the video series. Yep. So the component rendering tests. Yeah, exactly. So that, that side focuses on on isolating components and stress testing them. Yep. Uh, but yes. Maybe there's some more videos here with the uh, the test before commit workflow. Yeah. You know, that could be really cool. I definitely want to add some videos about how to use uh, Mirage with component integration tests because that's I mean, that's super powerful. Being nice. able to create a whole bunch of models with Mirage factories and then having them magically show up in your store mm -hmm. and then being able to render a component with like, you know, uh, blog post editor, post equals post. Right. And that post came from Mirage right. is, is amazing. That's great. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. Something you said was um, <clears throat> TDD presumes you know the interface or at least presumes you know the behavior you're testing. Like you could say, someone could say, okay, at a high level, you're building something, so you know what you're building. So you could write a high enough level test. But the reality is, like, the test relies on the implementation in some way. Like, when you're, when you're implementing it, you're going to be, I mean, you kind of want to stay at one level, but like the fact is, you're going to have to go up and down on different levels. Right, right. So. Um, so the way you put it was like, there's discovery that happens while you're building the feature. And so, um, that's kind of interesting, right? Like, T 
TDD presumes you know everything beforehand. Part of like development in general, and even like agile development, is that discovery is an ongoing thing. And um, well, it just made me think like sometimes we talk about what are cheaper ways to discover the things that we need to know. Like, mm-hmm. what are the cheapest ways to do that? And on a project I'm working on right now, I'm actually not coding, um, but I am helping discover what it is we need to build, and I'm doing that by prototyping in Sketch. Yep. And it's been pretty awesome. I think to answer that, like, how can you discover things? You're cheaply. always going to be discovering things, so how can we discover them cheaply? Like, think about Sketch. You're never going outside of Sketch. Right. So you're staying at that level. Yes. So I think if, if you were going to apply this logic to app code, you would say, listen, only use, like, domain components right. and write acceptance tests. And but just, you and usually work. sometimes especially early on a project, have to sometimes build new domain components to accommodate the thing just because as a developer, you are able to operate so easily switch between all these levels. Yeah. Whereas Sketch, you're constrained. I mean, you could, so you, but you have, that's a thing. You have to have the discipline to not switch right. between the levels. Because in Sketch, you can't, right. you can't just start writing Ember code. Right. You're in Sketch. As soon as you start writing Ember code, we no longer get to say Sketch. Um, you can name things and get things wrong there. So if you start going crazy with like symbols and naming things, yes. that's kind of a that's kind of an analog to premature abstraction. Yeah. So that would be like create all your symbols right. before you've created yes. an artboard. Yes. Um, and you know, I don't I don't have a ton of experience working like you know some of the designers we worked with in the past where they are managing very large artboards, tons of artboards with big projects and like how they manage things sustainably like how they organize things and i mean this even comes up with video management like how do you name your video files and your folders and stuff (laughs) it's it's like a similar problem but definitely for this project and for this scope like doing as much discovery in sketch is so cheap by the time the developers get to work on it there is still discovery like there's still things i hadn't considered once you build it like uh where is this data coming from oh right it's that thing or how does this get associated with this like there was something you hadn't thought of and I think that's fine. That's part of the thing, and we need to embrace that. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Pretending that we can, we can do all the discovery in the planning phase is like, is just wrong, right? And it's just stupid to think that. And it's, that's how, you know, that's why estimates are so bad. Like, we were talking about this article. I shared this article in our Slack about pure UI from Guillermo Rauch, the guy from Next, and um, his company is uh, called Zite. And he kind of goes over this at in the programming level, but it, I was thinking about the sketch work I was doing because it was so similar. Where, you know, you you design all these states, you try to think about every state, and then you get between them, and then you actually build it, and you're like, well, what about when the network request is slow, or what about when the network goes down, or what when the user turns off Wi-Fi, or there's this data that exists without this thing, and it's like, yeah, there's just so many things, but it's. I think tools that will help us con- do that earlier and cheap, more cheaper are going to continue to be a big part of our workflow as developers. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't, you don't, I mean, it's fine if you're building an app and you're like, listen, I don't care if the Wi-Fi goes down. Yeah. That's not who I'm making the app for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, being able to know early on that you don't care about that rather than when it happens. Yes. Is, yeah. And I just really like tying that fundamental problem of discovering what it is we're going to build. Because if you told me to build an app, like if you told me to build these 10 features from Trello in an app, okay, I can write tests for them. I can build it and write tests for them. I know exactly what those features are and what they do, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not the hard part. Mm -hmm. Yes. Looking at an app and knowing exactly, like the thing that makes what we do hard is the fact that... It's not built yet. Yeah. And it's not known. All the things aren't known yet. There's things right. that we don't know about it yet, and those are going to be have it, have to be discovered. Right. But um, and sometimes the best way to discover is by building those and, and getting the app in front of a user's hands. Yes. Just again, need to get there quickly. Right. And I just yeah, and just it's just interesting bringing this back to testing, right? Because like, if you're writing a test for something you don't know, well then yeah, you want to make that test like very disposable. And we've talked about disposable tests before. Um, you know, sometimes when you're doing low level things, tests are actually a good way to discover, right? There is code that we write where tests help us discover actually the fastest, where if you think about some of the, some of the server code that we've written, or even when I've worked on Mirage before, 
there's things that are so hard to keep track of in our head that um, um, like delimiting all the possible paths in a state in a test in a very rigorous way is actually the best way to discover the interface we need. So I've, I find that interesting that sometimes I feel very drawn to use tests as a way to discover, but then when doing UI stuff, I feel like it's not it's not necessarily the best way to, like I just wanna be doing, I wanna be at my artboard, like just drawing in the Ember app, like doing development and then finding out like, okay, now I know enough, I'm gonna start writing a test here. I mean, maybe there's a missing link that, that you need to take sketch files and somehow turn them into tests and, and then that gets you back on that red green reflector right. cycle. That's okay. true, so maybe that's, that's interesting. <laughs> Next billion dollar company. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, I think that's it for today. So uh, if you want to hear more about any of the work we do, get some old podcast episodes or see our latest videos, check us out at embermap.com. And uh, thanks for joining us. See you next week. Bye.